Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Most High God. Praise the Most High God. And welcome to all of you here in the live audience and welcome to social media world. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. We've been having some technical difficulties. If anybody observed that, that's fine. But you know what? It's real. Life is real. There are real problems. I want to say thank God for answering prayers with regard to Hurricane Florence. Some of you may not have seen the hand of God, but God showed up in a mighty way because when that storm began, the hurricane, it was a category four, and then it went to category three. It went back to category four, and then to three, then to two, then to one. Hallelujah. Amen. And now it's a storm. Yes, there are a few deaths. Yes, there is flooding. But can you imagine if God had not still that storm? What a horrible devastation would have taken place in North and South Carolina, and I think Virginia was also going to be hit. So thank you, Father. Thank you, Almighty God, for your mercy. Somebody say thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Hallelujah. Let's give God some praise. We must not forget. Some of us prayed about it, so we give God thanks. The Lord is still in charge. He is still God. Hallelujah. So today we're going to talk about a subject that um, isn't much spoken about in churches. I don't know. Maybe it is. I, from what I think, I don't care about it. But anyway. As always here at Ambassadors for Christ Ministries, my sole and only authority is the Holy Bible. So, dearly beloved, take this book in your right hand and say with me, This is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. I believe it. I believe it. I will study it. I will study it. I will teach it. I will teach it. I will preach it. I will preach it. And I will live by it. And I will live by it. For the glory of Yeshua. For the glory of Yeshua. Amen, amen, and amen. So my topic today, if you just go back here, is the marriage of the Lamb. Everybody here loves the word marriage. Maybe you didn't love your marriage, but you love the word. You look forward to a wedding, I don't know, you know, we all have our views. But let's be honest, in every culture, marriage is supposed to be a great time. People look forward to it, right? Even though if things may not work out well, but there's something with marriage that's beautiful. Amen. So, your marriage might have been a great marriage, whether it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago or one year ago. Um, you know, we have great historical records of the kings and queens getting married and all the royal celebration. And it's all beautiful. And how it works out, I don't know. All I know is that marriage is a beautiful thing. Amen? Amen. And people prepare for it, big time. You know, for some people, the preparation takes a long time. Months, even sometimes years, depending on you know what you plan, and every specific detail is has to be worked out. You know all the flowers, who will be the attendants, the entourage. You know the the cost, where will the banquet be held, who will officiate. You, you all of those things. I know because I've functioned in many marriages as a pastor over all these years. Well, today I want to talk about the greatest marriage of all. You see, there is a marriage that is about to occur that is greater than every marriage that has ever taken place on the earth. And that marriage is the marriage of the Lamb. Amen? Amen. The marriage of the Lamb. So when you see the word the marriage of the Lamb, obviously there's some questions we have to ask. Marriage. What do you mean marriage? And the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? And it says the Lamb, so the Lamb has to have a wife. Who is the wife? You see what I'm saying? It's the marriage, the Lamb, and the wife. Praise God. This sermon hopefully will stimulate you and will encourage you, will motivate you, will inspire you if you are part of the wife. Oh, yeah. See, the Lamb is getting married. The Lamb of God. And who is the Lamb of God? We all know the answer. Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus the Christ. Yeshua HaMashiach. So let's open the Bibles. We can open the Bibles as we normally do. And we are going to learn a lot today by God's grace. In Revelation chapter 19... Revelation chapter 19. Now we're breaking into the scripture here, of course. Uh, Revelation is the book of prophecy, end time prophecy. Now, I'm not going to discuss the details of Revelation because that's a whole different subject. Let's please understand the book of Revelation is prophetical, right? It's a book of prophecy. So, certain things are going to happen very soon. And in Revelation 19, after this, we have a certain sequence of events. And then, I, I will come to the sequence in a short while, but I want to go to what chapter is it? Chapter 19. And here we go, verse, verse 6. So, 
John is writing, John the Apostle. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great mountain, as the sound of many waters, as the sound of mighty thunderings. So John is writing what he's hearing. This is a loud voices and thunderings, many voices, multitudes. And what are they saying? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why? For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. And who is the Lord God omnipotent? Our great God, Jehovah. Right? The Lord God omnipotent reigns. He reigns. Now, why are they shouting he reigns? Is he not reigning now? Well, yes, he is reigning now. But not in the fullness of the kingdom of God yet. Are you with me? Yes. So now they're shouting, now they're shouting for the Lord God reigns. Because, because, understand the context, God in His great divine plan of salvation has allowed this earth for the last 6,000 years to be under the limited control of the devil. Do you understand that? Yes. I said limited because the devil does not have full power over the earth. No, he does not. But God, Yahweh, God Almighty, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, by His divine will, has allowed the devil to have a certain measure of power over all the nations of the earth. But the day is coming when that power is going to be removed. And something beautiful is about to happen. So watch. So they're shouting, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad. Let us what? Be glad and rejoice and give Him glory. That day is coming when the world, the earth, the nations will give God glory. Today that's not happening. But what is going to happen on that day? Well, next part of the verse. For, let's go to the other part of the verse. Let us rejoice. For, now watch this. This is beautiful. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. This is future. The marriage of the Lamb has come. So in other words, as John is writing prophetically, that marriage has not taken place. That marriage has not yet taken place. Has come. And his wife has made herself ready. Watch this carefully. His wife has made herself ready. It's not saying that the groom has made himself ready. The groom is ready. The groom is always ready. You know why the groom is ready? Because he's God. The groom is Jesus. The groom is Yeshua. The groom is ready. The groom is just waiting for that according to the time that God Himself, God the Father has planned, the wife has to make herself ready. So, so my focus of the sermon is going to be about the wife making herself ready, not the groom. Are you with me, church? It doesn't matter because the, the groom is always ready. Christ is perfect. He is the Lamb of God and a, a great marriage is about to take place. So the wife has made herself ready. Now, let's go further, see how this readiness, what it means. And to her, to her, her whom? The wife, to the bride. And to her, it was granted. So God makes it possible. To her, the wife, the bride, whatever word you want to use, there's a marriage. If there's a marriage, there must be a groom and there must be a bride. Amen? And to her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen, and now John explains what this fine linen means. He's not talking about royal attire in terms of some fancy purple dress or red dress or red gown. He is explaining spiritually. We're talking spiritual things here now. Amen? Amen. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Amen. So now we get to identify who the bride is. Watch. Everything is in the word of God. There is no secret except those things which God doesn't want to reveal to us. But in this sermon about the marriage of the Lamb, what is very clear is who the bridegroom is and who the groom is and who the bride is. Amen? So the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Who are the saints? Who are the saints? Who are the saints? Right, so all of us know when we speak about the saints, we are speaking about the church. There are different interpretations of this, and you know, I'm not here to argue with anybody's interpretation. I give you what the Bible shows me very clearly. Do I hear amen? amen? So, continuing here to verse 9. Verse 9, we go on down here in the scripture. Then he said to me, <clears throat> so the angel says to John, Write. Now here's the blessing. Blessed are those, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
So there is a marriage ceremony and there is a marriage supper. Two things, right? One thing is a marriage ceremony and then there's a marriage supper. So the bridegroom is going to get married. Now a blessing to all who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. Wow, John was so impressed. You know, it's amazing. Um, you don't have to put this verse there. But John was so impressed by this vision. It was so awesome, so marvelous beyond words that John did something kind of out of character for him. <laughs> the Bible says it. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. Verse 10, and I fell at his feet to worship him. John, knowing that the only being can worship is God, he fell at his feet. He was so overawed by the experience. He fell at his feet to worship the angel. And the angel said, no, 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 no. Don't do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Amen? Amen. Worship God. And by the way, just so you understand this. Of the very fact that the angel commanded John to not worship the angel, but worship God, is all the evidence you we should have or need why human beings must not worship any other human being. You know, there are some churches and denominations where they worship the founder. And the founder is like a god. Um, I don't need to call names, or do I need to call names? Yeah, maybe I could, huh? Not to bring you down, but to give you truth. You know, the Mormons worship Joseph Smith. Oh, they will say no, they don't. But he's, his book is like better than the gospel. That's the Bible, right? Joseph Smith. Well, let me be clear with you. God didn't use Joseph Smith to bring any new truth. All right? Oh, the Seventh-day Adventists, they almost worship Ellen G. White. Well, let me be very clear with you. God didn't use Ellen G. White to bring any new truth. That's celebrity worship. Worship only God. Amen? Go ahead, amen. 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 I really don't care what men say, brothers and sisters. My loyalty is to Christ and Christ only. And anybody who's loyal to Christ, you're my brother and sister in the Lord, right? So my loyalty will be to you. But my loyalty to you is based first on my loyalty to Christ. Amen? amen. If you're disloyal to Christ, then we can't be buddies. Am I on the same page with you? Yes. Everybody agrees? Yes. So now, let's understand what this is all about. This is absolutely present. This hasn't happened. Dearly beloved, this marriage has not yet taken place. Now for us to fully grasp what this marriage is all about, I need to take you back into the Jewish culture a little bit. By understanding, you know, the Bible, remember all of God's initial orig original apostles were Jews. Do we know that? Yes. yes. They were not Gentiles. They were not Catholics. <laughs> they were not Pentecostals. They were not Presbyterians. They were not Muslims. They were not Hindus. Believe it or not, like it or not, they were Jews. Amen. So the Bible is the Jewish book. <laughs> yeah, but believe it or not. So when we talk about a marriage, the context is of a Jewish marriage. So when you understand a Jewish marriage back then, this scripture or these scriptures or this message, the marriage of the Lamb, will make more sense. The Jewish marriage had three or four parts, depending on how you call apart. But let me explain you and see what I'm saying. The first part of the marriage was the betrothal. In the betrothal, the groom's parents would be at the bride's house, and there at the bride's house, they would negotiate the price of the bride. Did you know that? Listen well now. You learn a lot. So, unlike say, in America, where parents hardly get involved except to pay the bills. Um, did you get my point? In, in America, the young man and the young woman, they go on a date somewhere, they go on their honeymoon first, then if, if it works out, they get married, and then they tell the parents, all right, that's not how a Jewish marriage was done. So the parents of the groom would go to the bride's, the bride's parents, they would negotiate the price of the marriage contract, the, the, the bride, and there was a marriage contract. And that marriage contract was really as valid as a wedding. She was at that point the wife. Mary, for example, Joseph and Mary. Mary was the wife of Joseph, but not in a sexual sense, not yet. She was still living with her parents. There normally would be a one year waiting. So what would happen in a Jewish wedding then? The, bride, the groom's parents go to the bride's home, speak to the father and the mother, whoever. They work out the contract, they work out the details, and then the groom with his parents, they go back to their house. 
Well, what happens for one year? For one year, the guy, the groom, is getting ready in a sense of preparing a place for his bride. He has one year to do that. And one year, the girl, the bride, has to go through her treatments of purification and beauty and it took a long time to get beautiful. Okay, so all right. You know, I don't know if she went to the um, makeup cosmetic shop. I don't think they had those then. Their cosmetics were all natural. Even in some countries today, that is still done. And I have witnessed some of that happening in the nation of India. It's amazing. Okay, so she had to go through one year of getting ready. Listen well. One year of doing what? Getting ready for the return of the groom. With eager anticipation. Can you imagine? how much anticipation she would have and the parents, the contract had been signed, she was already legitimately the wife and she had to make us be pure, be clean, be holy, be sanctified, do her beauty treatments, whatever they were back in the culture and then await the day. Okay, so that's part one, there is part two, the one year waiting period, if you want to call that a part, then there is part three. Part three at the end of the year, if that was the normal, that was a normal contract, one year. At the end of that year, the groom returns to the bride's house. But he returned at night time. At night time. The bride would be made aware that the groom was coming back that night. She wouldn't know precisely what time. So she was supposed to get herself ready. Remember the parable of the ten virgins? Five wise and five foolish? Uh -huh. I will go to that if time permits. So she has to get herself ready. She knows that such a, such a date at this night time. The groom would appear. The groom would come to do what? To take the bride. She would leave the father's house. So he comes with his entourage. She would have an entourage ready, her bridesmaids and whatever else, and then take her back to the home of his father, which a home which she, he has now prepared. When they return, when he takes her back to the father's house, then there was going to be the big ceremony and the big banquet. The actual banquet sometimes can last days. It wasn't like what we do today, you know. Uh, we rent a hall for three hours, have a big party, have some speeches. No, they party for a whole week. It was a big event, right? And then she became, so to speak, that's it. He, she was now his wife. Wherever he lived, that's where she lived. Do I amen? Amen. When you understand what I just said, then you understand what Christ has done. Yes. Are you with me now? Yes. So, let me help you understand this. 2,000 years ago, not one year ago, 2,000 years ago, God the Father sent God the Son to the earth. Right? And there was a contract signed. The contract was signed in the blood of Jesus. The price, the price that the Father paid to get the bride was the blood of His own Son. Are you listening? Not a diamond ring with one million dollars. No, something worth more than a million dollars. For the blood of Christ is priceless. The precious blood to redeem us from the corruptible and to make us incorruptible. Right? So Messiah came to the earth 2,000 years ago and he purchased the bride by his blood. Then, after the purchase, the redemption, that's at Calvary's cross, what does he do? He goes back to the Father. Right? Are you with me, everybody? Yeah. Is it making sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He goes back to the Father, and now he is preparing, he is preparing to receive the bride. So he says, I go to prepare a place for you. Amen? Amen. I go to prepare a place for you, so that where I am, there you may be also. Amen? That's heaven, yes. We are going to heaven, but not to stay forever. I have explained that already. So, where, what Christ is doing right now as high priest, he is working with his bride to get her ready. That's you and me. I said you and me. Whether you're male or female, if you are a person who believes in Christ, and I will tell you, basically if you're washed by the blood, then you are a part of the marriage contract. You signed the contract. You said, yes, I want to be the bride. This is not referring to the Jewish people here. Some people misinterpret this and say, that's a reference to the Jews. No, this is the church. Amen? We are speaking about the church. So you see the four parts, right? Part one, if you want to 
make it itemized like what I'm doing. Part one, the groom goes with his parents to the girl's house, they sign the contract, they pay the price, the betrothal period, he goes home, and for one year, he waits there while she is preparing herself for the ceremony and the banquet. Amen? And he returns, and he takes her home, to the home he has prepared for her, they will have the ceremony, they will have a big banquet for three, four days, maybe a week long, and then she becomes his forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody praise the Lord. Amen. Glory to God. Now, this is why, by the way, it's good to understand when you study the Bible, you need to understand Jewish culture. It is impossible, and I, I mean this, it is impossible to understand the Bible through the eyes of American culture. American culture has nothing to do, yeah, hardly any similarities with Jewish culture. And unfortunately, our culture goes further and further away from God. Right? So that today in America and many countries, marriage is almost meaningless now. Think about it. In fact, in America, just to make my point, in the USA today, as in many Western nations, many people don't even get married. They live together, there is no contract. There is no promise until death do us part. There is no such thing. Hey, let's get together. Let's have some sex. And the babies come along great. And if we like each other, we stay with each other. If we don't like it, you go your way. Find the next man. I'll go my way. Find the next wife. Nothing sacred. Nothing holy. It stinks. It's a perversion. And by the way, if anybody's involved in that lifestyle, you are not part of the bride. You cannot be. Please understand. I will tell you the word of God. As I've often said, and I'll say it until my dying breath, I will not compromise the word of God for anybody or for any price. Amen? Amen. I will not compromise the word of God for any human being and not for any price. Because one day I have to stand before the Lord. Amen. So, do we understand then the Jewish wedding? Yes. So now you understand what what we're talking about. So John says, I see the future. Now, if we go back, I want to go back to Revelation 19. I don't, I, before I go to 2 Corinthians 11, I want to go back to Revelation 19. Uh, where is the social media? I don't know where they went. But Revelation 19, if you go back there, Revelation 19, please go back there. I want to go to verse 1. Verse 1, verse 1. After these things. So, in Revelation 19, verse 1, it follows in sequence after Babylon falls. Now Babylon hasn't fallen. Babylon is a reference to the world's corrupt system. Not just the city of Babylon. When we see Babylon in Revelation, it mostly refers to the corrupt system that mankind has developed. Babylon falls. When Babylon falls, chapter 19 verse 1, After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven say hallelujah salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God Amen. it always has belonged to the Lord our God but in the prophetic sequence finally the world will see it all right so for true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot God has judged the great harlot now it's interesting he uses the word harlot and then later on, talks about the wife has made herself ready. What a contrast. Did you get what I just said? Yes. The woman of the world, spiritually speaking, in Babylon, Babylon is seen as a harlot. Whereas the bride of Christ is seen as pure and holy. What a contrast, church. What a contrast. So, he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. The earth is still in a state of spiritual fornication. Do we understand? Yes. Mankind is still in a state of spiritual adultery. Not to mention the act of physical adultery. But spiritually speaking, the world is adulterous. God has to put an end to this stinking, evil, perverted culture. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again, verse 3, again they say, Hallelujah! Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God. They worshipped God who sat on the throne saying, Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And then, after that verse 5, we see 
the word the wording let us rejoice and be glad for the marriage of the lamb has come so the marriage when will this marriage take place see i'm just trying to answer the question for you the marriage of christ to the church has not yet taken place two thousand years ago there was a betrothal for two thousand years god has been adding to the church for two thousand years you and i are here if god had closed the chapter of history for the bride 100 years after Christ you and I would be around right for 2,000 long years God has been preparing the church for the wedding thank God for that amen, amen. he has called people from every nation and every tribe and every race and every language group amen, amen. he brings us together and welds us and unites us as one body one church one bride. So even though we are components, we are different individuals, you are you and I am I, I am me, and we may look different and be of different backgrounds or whatever that's irrelevant to God, through Christ, He unites all the races, and that's why racism is so nasty. He unites all the races and all the language groups and all the peoples of different ethnic backgrounds and different cultural backgrounds, he brings them into one body called the household of God, the body of Christ, the church of Christ, the bride of Christ. Are you with me? Yes. Amen? Amen? So all this work has been happening for 2,000 years. Plus, during this past 2,000 years, and up to the point of his return, not only is he bringing more and more people into the body, but he is refining us, defining us, shaping us. In other words, in other words, listen well, in the same way as the bride had one year to prepare herself through the purification treatments and the beauty treatments and whatever else she would have had to do back then, what do you think God is doing with us right now? He is purifying us. Amen? Amen. Amen? Yes. God is, does not want, if I may put it this way, let me ask you this, which father or which mother, which parent, which parent wants for his son or daughter a horrible spouse? 